Hello. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Hello. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Hello. 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 Can you hear me now? Yes, can yes, you? yes. Oh, very good, very good. For some reason, uh, my computer doesn't allow me to uh, switch on the microphone. And that's why um, I had to pick up my uh, mobile phone and uh, get connected through that. So hello everybody, my name is Evgeny Kucharavi and I'm the, uh, um, the uh, moderator of this uh, today's uh, seminar on the uh, selected topics in advanced networks and applications. And uh, thank you so much everybody for uh, attending this uh, seminar. It's um, a part of the outreach program of the uh, Russian education system, uh, and uh, we are proudly to have speakers today from the uh, MIEM University um, in, in Moscow, then uh, Brno University of Technology in uh, Czechia, and then uh, University of uh, Coimbra in Portugal, and uh, Tampere University in Finland. So uh, I see that all speakers are uh, online currently, and uh, we can uh, start the uh, in accordance to the timetable that we have and uh, the first uh, speaker so let me check if alex is here yes i see alex is here uh, alexey krestuk uh, is going to give a presentation on the uh, uh, capacity estimation of a slotted multi-user communication channel. Alexei, can you start uh, sharing your presentation? Uh, yes, one moment. Okay. Yeah, very good. The floor is yours. Uh, yeah, please uh, go ahead. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. I'm going to talk about. Uh, ah, so at first, do you hear me, right? Because uh, Zoom doesn't show anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I, I have I have everything on the screen. I see the the front page of the presentation. So just to try to figure out. Probably just open on the uh, uh, hidden window. Yeah, it's all good on my side. Okay, and you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can hear very well. Thank you. Okay, uh, so. Uh, I'm going to talk about the capacity of slotted multi-user communication channel. Uh, the idea is the following. First, I'll talk about the, what this channel is, and then I'll talk about what the capacity is. So first, let's start with the channel description. Uh, we have this kind of simple channel. So uh, all the 
like uh, symbols are divided into uh, several subchannels or slots. And each slot has several symbols uh, transmitted in them. And we have perfect synchronization between these slots among all the users. So there are multiple users. Each one wants to transmit some data uh, inside some shared resource. For example, this might be OFDM frequencies, or this might be some uh, just time slots. Uh, and for each slot, it can only either transmit some energy or transmit zero. So it's like on-off keying here. There are, well, this uh, here you can see all the uh, definitions. Uh, I mean, uh, all the notions. So we have uh, sub frequencies with or some independent channels. We have vector lens. We have a uh, number of slots. We have number of users. And as users don't uh, know anything about each other, they transmit independently. They select uh, some slot and decide to transmit that and transmit their own word of lens L. Uh, and here we have the probability of collision of order T. Uh, when we're talking about collision of order T, we uh, assume that we are transmitting in this slot and there are T additional uh, users that also transmit our, in our slot. And we want to see uh, what the probability that our transmission was is failed. So here you can see the probability of the collision itself and the uh, fixed order of the collision. Uh, let's also note that uh, if the users that uh, transmit in our slot uh, only transmit some vectors, the, uh, the support of which lies inside ours, then this, our transmission is not affected. We transmit our vector and it's received very well. Uh, and so not all these kind of collisions really lead to errors. Uh, and if, it, uh, if we consider all the interference as a kind of noise, uh, then we can see that we have this transition diagram uh, in which, uh, well, we can get from zero to any vector. For, and if we transmit uh, only once, then we can only get, uh, well, then our vector cannot be uh, received with errors. So we have this kind of uh, uh, tunability. We can transmit different number of ones of units in our code words, and it does affect the error probability. Uh, so, but we uh, suppose that we have this kind of simple distribution, like a normal distribution, or more correctly, the result of uh, Bernoulli experiments. Oh, Bernoulli distribution. Okay, and we don't try to transmit any kind of uh, more complicated code word because the lens is very slow, very low. Okay, and if we transmit two symbols that we have this kind of transition matrix, which is uh, just a chronic product of the tra ma transition matrix for a single uh, symbol. We can also have uh, the collision order that is not one, but some, but T. And in this case, we have just the uh, usual product of uh, the transmission transition matrices. And so now we have defined our channel. We have uh, like uh, this transition matrix for uh, order T collision. We have this kind of transition matrix uh, for long um, subslots for long vector lengths. And we can now talk about the capacity because capacity shows us how much uh, information we can transmit in this channel uh, if we select like kind of the best possible uh, coding scheme. So, uh, now, what also I want to, what I didn't tell you earlier is that we suppose that each user has uh, the same uh, probability distribution. So it uses like the same code book. Uh, it's not like they try to have uh, some kind of uh, synchronized code books. No, they have all the same code book. And so if uh, all users decide to increase the probability of transmitting unit, they will increase the probability that someone else will have uh, the erroneous reception. So it's not that evident how what is the optimal value of P. And that means that we will have to use some kind of um, uh, optimization procedure. So uh, the first simple estimate is that we can say that the uh, uh, capacity of this vector channel is uh, not less than the, the L times capacity of the single channel of, of the channel with the vector of length one. And the vector of lens, well, it has a very simple 
uh, capacity we can just use as a transition matrix and apply the mutual information uh, equation for it. And so it looks like this. In the trivial uh, case when uh, the collision order is zero, we just have uh, binary entropy, which is the capacity of uh, a channel with uh, this kind of uh, transmission if there are no errors. OK, so how, how can we estimate the capacity for uh, like a random collision probability? random collision order. We have uh, two different approaches. We have ergodic capacity. Uh, the idea here is that we try to take the expected value of the capacity with regards to the distribution t. Uh, this approach is widely used. Uh, it's simple. It's very simple to implement even for very complex channels. But uh, here we have some, we had some uh, thoughts that it should, it is not very correct. Uh, it's correct if both transmitter and receiver know the collision order, because in that case, they can uh, just select the right uh, coding scheme for this exact collision order. But in practice, no one knows the collision order. It's a random process. So we have a second approach. It's based on direct computation of the mutual information. In this case, we try to, well, just compute the uh, mutual information, but this requires us to manipulate the probability distributions, which are not very simple. Uh, so for this system, it's uh, more or less simple, but if we try to add noise, then everything becomes very hard. So we didn't do it in this work. But the estimate is correct. Mutual information is the capacity of any channel. And it's true when uh, neither receiver nor the transmitter knows the collision order, which is the usual case. So for the ergodic capacity, we have this kind of formula. Uh, it's simple, we just multiply the capacity estimate by the probability that we have this collision order. Very simple thing, nothing to talk about. Okay, for the mutual information, the formula is much more complicated. Uh, here we have the input distribution, we have the transmission, uh, transition probability, we have uh, the output distribution, which is important uh, for the mutual information formula. And we have this whole uh, capacity like this. And if you compare this to this, you can see that it's, well, more complicated. If you try to add noise, then uh, we'll also, uh, this equation will be much harder. I'm not sure we can even write it like this. And so, yeah, we will not even be able to write it like this because here, if we have like a vector of one weight that uh, transitions to a vector of another way, we have only two pros possible probabilities. Either it's uh, this value or it's zero, if the support doesn't cover, support of one doesn't cover the other. Yeah, but in the noisy channel, noiseless channel, we can write this equation. And now let's see what uh, just then plot it on a graph. So uh, as you can see, the ergodic capacity overestimates the real uh, capacity very much. So the recording capacity is much higher than the mutual information. And so uh, anyone who tries to, well, uh, identify what coding scheme can be used will be overestimating. Uh, and here you can see that it's as a function of the number of uh, active users. So we have uh, 2000, uh, Subchannels. We have, um, uh, uh, sorry, it's not, uh, I didn't write it uh, unfortunately here. Uh, L equal to eight, I think, here. And we change the number of active users and we also change the probability of uh, transmitting one, so the input distribution. For few users, these uh, curves seem to behave similarly, but as you can see, the maximum seems to be in a little in different places. So, okay, for eight users, it doesn't matter. It's like the same distribution. Uh, the, I mean, the capacity is nearly the same. Uh, for 32, it's, it seems that it's a little bit shifted. 
for 128, the differences were large, but in the maximum position is different. So we would have a suboptimal selection of coding scheme here, clearly. And here you can see it for a large number of users. And as you can see, the optimal code word density or the input distribution is uh, clearly different. The maximum is clearly in different positions. So if we try to optimize our coding scheme using the ergodic capacity, we'll get a very bad uh, coding scheme. Well, as you can see, for example, for 124 users, well, the optimal position is here, but if we try to uh, use this point for coding scheme optimization, we'll get lower capacity, in fact. Then if we use the mission formation. So the conclusion is that the expected value changes very much. Let's change the second. Uh, there are also possible future work. Uh, we can try to make this for noisy channel, but uh, the transferability is very much more complicated here. So we cannot use this simple equation, but it would have uh, two sums instead of one. Okay, and we also have, uh, uh, we also want to check if it's possible to select better, better input distributions than the Bernoulli distribution. Maybe it would, it would be possible to select some kind of distributions of uh, vector space uh, uh, that could have higher capacity. But it's still not clear of um, what this distribution might look like. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Alexei. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question to Alexei, uh, feel free to uh, unmute your mic and, and do that. I, I can start with the uh, my question that you just have time to 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 unmute your mic. So uh, you, on the last slide, you said that you're gonna have uh, some uh, better distribution than, than Bernoulli. Yeah. And uh, in what sense the distribution can be better? To, to uh, my understanding, the distribution is like, like it is, but what means better distribution? Uh, that means that this distribution would have uh, it would let us reach higher capacity. Uh, in the capacity, we have the maximum among all possible distributions on the input values. So currently, we just we uh, assume that this uh, distribution is a Bernoulli distribution. As this distribution yeah. reaches the maximum for most coding schemes. I mean, for most channels. Right. Right. Uh, but uh, here we have the channel uh, that is not memoryless. So it has some kind of memory because uh, like uh, stimulus, uh, the symbols inside one slot uh, will be affected by the same collision order. So this kind of memory might affect the perfect uh, distribution. And so we might need to like select a different kind of distribution. Yeah, but it, it doesn't mean that it is better. It's just uh, different that mimics uh, the behavior of the channel in question better, right? Uh, yes, of course. So, I mean, I meant better in sense that it would allow us to reach higher capacity. Okay. Better, better from practical sense, not from. Oh yes, sense. I see. I understand. Also, if you get back to the slide number eleven, yeah, and here uh, as well on the other uh, um, other formulas, you always. Uh, some the timing from T0 up to U minus one. Could you comment on that U minus one? I'm not fully understand that. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, U is number of total number of users. But when yeah. we're talking about the collision order, we're talking about the users beside ourselves. So we have one user, okay. which we try to yeah. understand the uh, error probability. And so we, we want to know how many users will affect you. And okay. that's maximum all others. Yeah, you just uh, uh, kind of by that discount your yourself from the uh, calculation. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm done with my questions. If anybody has anything to ask Alexei, 
please go ahead now. Seems like uh, uh, nobody wants. Excuse me, excuse me, Evgeny. May I uh, ask a question sure, too? Sure, go ahead, Anton. Uh, so, uh, Alexei, could you repeat, please? So, as far as I understand, your method of calculating the capacity is uh, more precise than uh, another one's. So, uh, what is the result? So, what is the uh, biggest, the largest advantage of uh, the provided method by your team uh, versus uh, previous ones? Well, uh, so what, is, what's the difference, the, the gain? Okay, so uh, the difference is that uh, it is uh, theoretically correct for the case when neither transmitter nor receiver knows the collision order or know the channel state information, yes. in other words. Uh, it's also possible to implement it for a case when, like, for example, receiver knows the collision order, but the transmitter doesn't. Uh, uh -huh. So this is uh, theoretically more correct, and it should give us more precise results. Okay. And uh, does it depend on uh, distribution of uh, uh, input source, so the distribution of input symbols or not? Uh, it does depend, of course, because here in this equation we have the input distribution, uh, but it's possible to do it for any kind of input distribution, but uh for well if you have a non bernoulli distribution all these equations would be harder for ergodic capacity of course it should be it should not complicate this uh, ever since that much in our case yes it's uh we need to derive all the equations for each kind of input distribution separately uh, okay, well, can you clarify for me, please? Uh, I'm not so close to this area, unfortunately. So why uh, are you using Bernoulli distribution or not uniform, for example? Uh, what so maybe there is a technical reason or uh, I, I don't know really. Uh, Bernoulli distribution is just a distribution where each symbol inside a vector has the same distribution. And uh, each symbol is just zero or one. Uh, so this kind of distribution reaches uh, the optimum, uh, reaches the capacity uh, for most channels that uh, are studied. Uh, it reaches it for all memoryless channels. Uh, so that's why we also consider this kind of distribution. It's like the default distribution for all coding theory. So it's uh, just from the reason that we can reach the maximum capacity for uh, all kinds of distributions. Uh, yes, it's uh, yes, it's true for memory, memoryless channels. It's not uh, yes, for, oh, oh, sure. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Alexei. So, do you have anybody else who want to to post the question to Alexei? If not, so then we can uh, move ahead and get. Uh, uh, the second speaker onto the floor, our virtual floor, Pavel Seda from uh, Brno University of Technology in Czechia. And uh, Pavel will be talking about AI anomaly detection for the uh, home data slots. So Alexei, could you yeah, discontinue the sharing? And now, uh, Pavel, I see you are on the Yeah, and you can unmute your mic. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I am I'm new to Zoom, so it's quite yeah, a challenge no for me. No problem. <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you, Pavel. So yeah, it is... Go ahead. Okay. It is visible the slide and also, also myself. Yeah, you are in the green forest, right? Okay, yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, so uh, this presentation is basically uh, the experience report uh, from the project between the Brno University of Technology and, and Telecom Austria Group. Uh, basically, I am a year PhD student under Jiří Hošek, supervising, and the uh, Telecom Austria Group is, is Franz Krepfel. Yeah, this project was, uh, was uh, 
held in one year and a half. And the, the main idea of this project was to build the MQTT convention to, to design the smart homes. So the project involves on, in developing a large scale of, of let's say services that are interconnected using some MQTT broker. The anomaly detection application that is based on some statistic methods, or let's say in, the, in these days, it's sometimes called artificial intelligence methods that are above the statistics methods. Um, this service is interconnected in the whole software solution. Uh, of course, you can imagine that uh, in these days where in, uh, Internet of Things services and, and other devices that are usually, uh, let's say, um, integrated in our, in our flats, houses, and so on, are uh, rapidly growing. So uh, the services like uh, artificial intelligence services and so on are necessary part of this house because it can, uh, let's say, um, detect or change the behavior of your, of your home based on your typical standards. For example, there is a story in this slide, you can read it, but of course you can imagine uh, a lot of scenarios uh, where it is good to have some service that is notifying you when something unexpected happens. The unexpected situation, uh, it, it's not necessarily just some thief or something like this. It can be, uh, of course, some uh, lights uh, forgot to turn off uh, when you are on a holiday and you lose, of course, some money and so on. So these systems can really help the whole solution to, to, to bring the, the biggest comfort for the, for the user or of this, of this complex system. Uh, this project was basically built uh, from four to five, five main blocks. Uh, as you can see, we have some TV dashboard. That is the dashboard that is, that is controlling the whole system using some remote control device. Uh, we have uh, MQTT to go broker, which is based on the MQTT convention that was, that was developed. And we have additional services like it's smart, smart home service to store and manage some user data. And finally, the anomaly reporting, that is the service we are describing in this presentation. Um, that is, let's say, monitoring and managing the, the unexpected situations. Okay. So the anomaly detection add-on, add-on means the additional service that is interconnected in the system, is based on the following schema. Uh, as you can see, the devices like camera, light, uh, and other sensors produce some messages. This is basically based on JSON messages with some, with some uh, basic, uh, basic values like, like status on eh, for the light, for example, if it turns on or turns off and so on, or for example, temperature and so on. Uh, this is sent to MQTT broker uh, that is working in a synchronous manner. It means it is not synchronous communication, but it is, it is throwing the messages uh, in, you know, in, in stream manner. And uh, to this MQTT broker, the anomaly detection application is is um, let's say connected using the subscribe method. So every time the device produces the MQTT message, the anomaly detection application is subscribing this message from MQTT broker and analyzing if the message is let's say behind the standard boundaries of the standard behavior of the users in the house. Basically, the application needs to needs to store. Uh, some data at the beginning because without the data we are not able to create any model. Of course, we can we can transfer it from another home or, uh, and so on, but it's not precise if you do like this. So you need at least two weeks to collect the data to uh, to know the uh, the typical behavior of the users in the how in the home, and 
Uh, then the NMLS detection application, if it treats like the messages outside the standard boundaries, it also produces the MQTT alert, which is also MQTT message to the MQTT broker. And additional services like TV dashboard and so on that are connected to this MQTT broker are then processing this MQTT alert to, to some uh, to some log and visualize the, the message to the user that some device is, is behaving in, in the weird way. So to check, to, to notify the user to check uh, what happens. Uh, this is general schema. Yeah? It doesn't say you anything how we do it, yeah? but it exactly shows you the process or the design of, of, this, of this system uh, in terms of animal detection. Uh, so in the beginning, we spent a lot of time to select the right analyzing method. Yeah? We have a plethora of options like machine learning, which is quite popular, popular these days, some basic statistic methods, heuristic algorithms, or meta-heuristic especially. And um, it's difficult to choose. In this scenario, we firstly try to use uh, machine learning and unsurpa, unsur, pardon, uh, sorry, uh, unsupervised learning. Be it's unsupervised because we don't have any labels. Yeah? We don't know what anomaly is in the beginning. So we try the k-means, kn, and uh, hierar hierarchical clustering and additional methods. However, these methods doesn't provide the right solution for our, it's, it's uh, surprising, but these methods in the beginning stage of development doesn't provide, provide the, let's say the results that we was, uh, or we were satisfied. So I will talk, talk more on other slides about this, but uh, this is just to, just to show you that there are really a large amount of of options how to how to develop any anomaly detection application uh, the additional task is how to choose the right tool yeah, we have plant tensor flow veka keras rapid miner or even elastic search with some additional packages like like expect machine learning and so on so also there is a question in the beginning what tool to choose yeah? Uh, of course, the disadvantage of, of these tools is that it always needs you to learn these tasks. It's always, uh, not always, but sometimes difficult to integrate these tools into the whole solution because it has uh, some constraints, for example, uh, some licenses uh, constraints, some, uh, let's say, constraints that are regarding, for example, if you are using Java or Python, that this solution is not, uh, not provided in terms of some library, it is just some external tool and so on. So it brings a lot of, a lot of constraints, but also it brings a lot of benefits because you don't need to implement a lot of things by your own. However, our final approach, uh, at least from at least in this stage of the of the development of this solution, is to omit all these all these let's say tools and the typical algorithms that uh, that seems promising in this uh, in this way, at least from the first point of view, and uh, we implement this uh, this um, anomaly detection application based on time series algorithms. It means we are creating the chunks for each time time frame in day and in week and in month and in year and based on that we are creating the models of typical behavior yeah, this solution is implemented in let's say in poor manner that uh, actually i was implemented uh, everything all alone in java and mysql and react react tools uh, where of course mysql can be replaced by by um, by some more complicated or complex solution like this Oracle database or Postgre. But at this, at this point of the development, it was sufficient to, to select these tools. And behind the scenes, uh, what we are doing, yeah? we are 
doing stuff like when each message is coming to the to the anomaly detection applications, we are providing the normalized values, uh, the normalization. Yeah? So each message is normalized uh, based on the min-max normalization, and we combine the meaningful values from the from the sensor into single value into single normalized value and that value is stored in the database so uh, and also not only normalized value but also all the values that are incoming into the anomaly detection service uh, without the normalization at the beginning the problem here that we faced uh, in this project is that and the sensor devices or the Internet of Things devices in general, uh, using this MQTT convention, are sending only one field. They are not sending the whole state of the, of the device. Like, for example, I don't know, socket is sending some, some um, voltage uh, and so on, but it is sending just, some, just one field at the moment. So, for that reason, we developed. Uh, uh, let's say the tables for each sensor that are storing the last values that was that was let's say that was captured uh, from the sensor okay. so we are combining the last values from the sensor with the new incoming value and this is the new new final value the new final state of the sensor and based on that we are normalizing the values and store it in the in the database this is the first part that is done in the in the let's say in the behaving with data so when we captured all the data and we say okay we have a lot of data we can use this these data to tra train the model the time series model which is for each sensor different yeah? uh, this must be of, of course um, let's say um, somehow improved um, based on each house and so on for each device what is the uh, what is the time frame for time series algorithm for each device so for example light we can have a time frame based on i don't know five minutes and so on and we know that in these five minutes the uh, the light is typically not on and uh, not turned on and so on so this is the basically the main idea behind the scenes. Uh, the solution is in, in final terms quite simple, I would say, but of course it leads a long way to, to provide this solution uh, and to, to test it in a prototype house and to present the results to Telecom Austria. Uh, this is the graph that is showing the basic idea. Uh, it is just for one sensor and for one type of time series algorithm this is daily based daily based model uh, you can see the blue line that represents the upper boundary for the normalized values for i think it's light sensor this, this one and uh, the green one that represents the lower boundary for the light sensor and the model is basically done based on these series then um, if, you know, if some MQTT message is coming to the anomaly detection application, the application is, is selecting the right frame uh, from, the, from, the, from the model. And if the message is outside the boundaries, it treats like it's anomaly. Yeah, so for example, this, this is anomaly because it's, uh, it's uh, below the green, green boundary. And also this is anomaly because it is above the blue boundary. So it is quite easily, is easily, let's say, understandable how the, how the solution is provide anomalies and how it de detects the, uh, the messages that are incoming to that solution. Yeah, this is, of course, some, some data that were cut it from the real uh let's say real monitoring from the from the telecom austria prototype house uh, because if we have all the messages um, visualized in this in this model then you will have let's say full of red dots uh, between the 
between the blue and green boundary. Okay. Uh, in the TV dashboard systems, the notifications about the anomalies are visualized by the following alert that is uh, saying what could happen. Yeah? For example, your TV ambient lights are unexpectedly on. Please check what is the source of the su of such event. Yeah, this is what we could know from the from the from the system. So we predefined some template method template messages um, that can be captured from the behavior um, based on the model. Yeah? And this message is shown to the user and also stored in the activity log to or persisted in the activity log to to show it later. Okay, uh, the lessons learned from this from this project was that it's not only the uh, the right way to choose the most modern algorithms and uh, and uh, areas to use some statistics or AI based method like a neural network, deep learning, and so on. And it's sometimes better to use, uh, let's say, some standard methods that were used um, a lot of years ago. Uh, but it still seems to provide uh, good results and uh, can be very useful in production environments. Okay. <clears throat> also, uh, the lessons learned from this uh, solution is that we can interconnect it any application in such a software solution if the software uh, solutions are, let's say, um, separated from each other. If this solution will be only one big project, monolithic application, it will be difficult to, to let's say, to, you know, to integrate the additional services and so on. So this AI-based application or, uh, or let's say, analytics application uh, is easily replaceable by any other application that will, that will be, for example, implemented using different methods and so on. So this solution is quite independent and uh, open to, to use other methods and other solutions. Also we find that processing was quite fast because when the, when the model is built uh, based on this time series algorithms, it is basically just one select to, to, to know if the incoming message is anomaly or not. So the, uh, so the result of of some unexpected behavior is known in, in fact quite very fast. And it can, it can be, of course, processed in any, any device that has connection to the database where the model is stored. Uh, as the conclusion for this project, um, we know that we should take essential, essential time to, to make uh, important decisions how to implement the, the solution. We know that these AI systems can be independently interconnected in the solution, as I mentioned before. And the big question is also how to train and retrain the model. Um, this is solution that, that must be, let's say, decided in the, in the production environment since, since uh, we need to know how much data, the, how much data in, in what quality, let's say, uh, the users are uh, producing from each house. So actually, uh, at this point of view, uh, we can just guess uh, what will be the, the right time to retrain the model, which is basically to rebuild the time series models based on the stored data. Uh, but uh, it is a big question how to do it effectively, effectively, what is the right time to do it, and so on. And also we know that this model, the final, final model solution can be composed from several simple models. As I mentioned in the slide five or six, I'm not sure now, uh, the, we can have several time series models, for example, based on daily basis behavior, based on weekly basis behavior, and based on month basis behavior. And the final solution, final model will be to check the time frame in all these simple models and this provides the general behavior in the house. For future research, we, uh, we suppose to, let's say, to try additional methods and to try to investigate the, 
um, let's say the combination of behavior of sensors because this solution is right now um, let's say mapped to each sensor separately so it is analyzing specific light yeah, with specific id of uh, device ID, home ID, gateway ID, and this group of IDs, but we are not analyzing analyzing the combination, for example, of uh, light in the kitchen and socket in the in the bedroom, yeah, and so on. So this is the future work that we need to consider what will be the best way to to um, let's say integrate this combination of values in the house. But for now, the analyzing of particular devices is, is quite sufficient. Okay, the credits for this project were, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, by Jiří Hošek as a project manager in this, pro in this project, Martin Stusek that was developing the firmwares and, and uh, the front end in a React application, Christoph Zeman, Pavel Mašek that were developing the MQTT convention, and my side that was let's say debugging the MQTT convention and providing this uh, data analytics application and Franz Krepf like project manager in uh, from Telecom Austria that was participating in the in the great ideas to to provide let's say um, near to production based service okay so thank you for your attention and hopefully um, it brings you some some informa mini, uh, meaningful information. Thank, thank you so much, Pavel, for the uh, excellent talk and uh, like uh, um, surveying what, what can be done uh, with the uh, theoretical things in, in practice. So it's uh, highly appreciated. Um, yeah, guys, we have time uh, to ask Pavel the questions and um, um, I would uh, start with mine. Um, the, the, you know, the, uh, as you mentioned that the credibility of data is something that is very important for the training algorithms, like uh, mm -hmm. you should have enough data, the data should be, you know, credible enough, yeah, mm -hmm. to, the, to, to uh, train your, your uh, AI based on that. So did, did you encounter any uh, real like um, um, serious issues uh, on the, like, I, I think you did some uh, like testing of the things, right? Yeah. After the training. So um, did you have sufficient amount of like date, new data to, to validate your training network, trained network? And um, how did you approach that, that question? Yeah. Because like uh, in, in the in the commercial product, the, the most important how you know how precise your your uh, uh, your results are and how they yeah. mitigate the, the problems. Yeah. Um, I was uh, capturing the data from two weeks, um, two weeks from the from the prototype house from Telecom Telecom Austria and the, this problem is very difficult. Eh? It's very difficult, difficult to answer this question because, for example, I was, um, let's say, storing the data from two weeks from the standard, yeah. standard process from the house. Eh? But the big issue is, for example, if you store the data from the house where, I don't know, you store two weeks, but one and a half week the family is on holiday. Eh? Yeah. So you, you have yeah. no data, but the actual time frame is two weeks. So right. uh, from my point of view, um, it's difficult. As I, as I mentioned, we can have several models like daily based, week based, mm -hmm. month based, and so on. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the month based model is not possible if you have only two weeks data because it's not, not right. Yeah, much. yeah. So uh, from my, to be honest, to, to have the best, best analytic application, you should have at least one year yeah, in this mm -hmm. kind of in this I kind see. of data, but I still think that as I was let's say prototyping in in the near um, in the uh, past few days, uh, we do additional 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 let's say var variable that is monitoring if the user is in or out the house, and the significantly uh -huh. right. the significantly uh, let's say. Um, 
improve improve the the detection because mm -hmm. fr from that point of view if we have only two weeks data and we know uh, when the user and how much are in home and out the home outer, uh, outside the home uh, we know that uh, if nothing happens in the house in some specific specific time that it's okay mm -hmm. yeah uh, and to solve this problem you know it's it's always necessary to add additional vari variables uh, yeah. that will that will let's say split this problem into several several scenarios. But it's difficult, you know. It's always, uh, from my point of view, these questions is is very valid and yeah. uh, and it um, it let's say pop ups in the production because it's <laughs> it's difficult to to think about all the all the scenarios that may happen, uh, but. Uh, as, as as you ask, it's it's good mm -hmm. to I be see. prepared to to address yeah. most of them. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Pavel. Another questions a question that that I had um, about this particular uh, graph that you presented and mm -hmm. it's currently displayed. You have here like two anomaly points, like mm -hmm. one is under the bottom border, yeah. and another one on the top of the top border. You know, uh, this kind of, uh, if you take the regular statistics approach so that uh, to analyze that sequence of the red, red uh, uh, dots, mm -hmm. well, again, it's like it's uh, uh, like just visually, right? Yeah. So I don't see any, uh, if the, the top border and bottom border would not exist, I, I don't see any kind of uh, the big issue there, right? For instance, if the like this red dot would appear somewhere really like on top, yeah. uh, like uh, really like very far from other dots, yeah. so that yeah. would be clear like anomaly. Here, the anomaly is detected just because of the uh, top and, and bottom border. Yeah. And the difference might be very, very minor. I yeah. mean, how do you comment that that this anomaly could be not an anomaly in in reality I just yeah. because your say uh, your your model for the top or bottom border is not that precise as like would be trained on the much much higher number of uh, data uh, larger uh, data set yeah the, these borders basically were, were developed uh, for the uh, blue blue line as mm. Is 98 percentile of value. So 90 per uh, under 90, uh, pardon, uh, 98 percentile of values. Yeah, uh, in this it. time yeah. frame in in the mm -hmm. daily base model were under the blue line. Yeah, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and above two percentile of uh, values in each frame time frame uh, was uh, above the green <coughs> green line. So yeah, yeah. this is based on these percent percentiles, yeah. And this can the range of the percentile, of course, can be can be changed in the production. Yeah. For example, to ninety nine percent and one yeah. one percent. And if the value is outside this boundary of standard, let's say let's say standard boundaries, then it's anomaly. Yeah. And even if the red red uh, red well, let's dot. say let's dot yeah let's dot um, red dot is is let's say normal without these boundaries from the first yeah. point of view yeah these percentiles in specific time range makes mm. in anomaly okay okay yeah, so right. it's, sim it's yeah. simple idea but but very powerful <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's clear okay thank you pavel um anybody want to ask anything uh pavel about his uh, research his uh, presentation We'll wait for five seconds. Uh, I think everybody had uh, sufficient time to open the mic. All right, thank you so much, Pavel, once again for your interesting presentation and uh, spending time here. Thank you, and we can move forward. And okay. the thank next, you. Uh, thank you. And the next speaker is. Uh, uh, Marco Silva from uh, University of Coimbra in Portugal. 
and uh, Marco. Uh, the floor yes, I'm here, yours. I'm here. Yeah, oh, very good, very good. Can you see uh, my screen or not? Not yet, I think it's coming. Okay. Yeah, it's coming. Maybe now we you, see the- You can yeah. see the presentation, right? Yeah, we see the beautiful front page. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the invitation to be here and to share my work with you. Uh, my name is Mark Silva. I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Coimbra. So today I'm going to show you my work from last year, uh, which served for my master thesis in Cytoloristic and Simulation of Energy Harvesting IoT Network. Here on this slide you have my email, so feel free to send me an additional or more complex questions that you might have. Uh, before moving on to the details, let's first make a short overview of the real needs that uh, this work tries to address. And uh, for that, it is important to answer one simple question, uh, what is wireless sensor networks uh, in Internet of Things? So the Internet of Things uh, re 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 represents a wide environment of objects uh, connected to the Internet, uh, independent of uh, its shape or computational capacity. So this facility that we currently have to connect any object to the Internet uh, creates a new concept called wireless sensor network. And this concept uh, was very important for the basis of this work because it represents the number of small devices uh, called sensor nodes, the, which are developed to capture and collect information in a network uh, with internet connection. Therefore, nowadays, uh, they play a fundamental part, special since this type of devices have different applications, for example, territorial space control, critical system control, or natural disaster prevention. So not only that, but um, this type of network can be also useful in smart cities. And this was the main point for the development of this work, uh, which is a part for, of a research project called Mobiwise uh, that aims to improve circulation in smart cities uh, through the development of a platform of sensors, people, cars, and objects connected to the network. Uh, however, uh, given the infinity of different types uh, of devices that you may have connected to the internet, and sometimes given their small sizes, uh, developing applications for wireless sensor networks is not exactly easy. So the first major problem that we tried to answer was exactly related to the question of uh, having a wide range of devices with different capacities and sizes connected to the network. So in, or, in order to solve this, we tried to develop a low level sensor application, uh, which could be implemented in several sensors, uh, regardless of the hardware or particle application. Uh, still, we had another problem. Uh, the sensors could be extremely small and sometimes we placed in zones with uh, difficult access uh, dispersed around the world. So how can the battery management be done? And this was uh, the second question that we tried to um, to answer by exploring the topic energy harvesting. And energy harvesting is nothing more than the, the capture of energy uh, derived from external sources by the, these small devices. So we have several so sources that we can explore like solar energy, thermal energy or wire wireless power transfer. But in our case, uh, we focus on the analysis of the solar energy uh, to, to create a network that in a finite period of time uh, operates perpetually. So our goal was to develop a heuristic that uh, allowed the sensors to optimize the battery level at all times. So at the end of each time frame considered, our sensors would have a battery level equal to or greater than they had in the beginning. And as you can see in this graph, uh, sensors manage their battery level according to their operations. Uh, but what is important to notice is, is that at the end of the considered time frame, uh, our sensors have a battery level equal or higher than beginning. So this is called the N operation or energy neutral operation, uh, which was um, what you're trying to achieve. To do that, we started by developing uh, and studying a theoretical model, uh, which describes an entire linear programming model, uh, defining all variables associated with the behavior of sensors and energy consumption, uh, like consumption in transmission, reception, and uh, of course, because uh, this was an initial and, and quite pre preliminary study, uh, we, we had to consider some sim simplifications of a real scenario. So in this model, for example, uh, we do not consider questions related to the network protocols, because at that point, we just wanted to study the behavior of sensors uh, in terms of energy. So 
uh, always keeping in mind the, the real scenarios, of course, but uh, we were still able to define some guidelines and some standard results that could be replicated later uh, by developing a distributed heuristic. And this uh, heuristic improves the theoretical model and considers sensory communications that uh, re reply in a more realistic way. Um, the optimal solutions obtained by the theoretical model always achieving the energy neutral operation. So it also has the particularity of allowing an easy implementation in real scenarios, given that it was designed and considering, considering the requirements of real hardware. And um, this uh, heuristic gives, gives support for multi-op networks with event capture and data aggregation. So these main features, uh, this heuristic is distributed where each sensor individually can optimize its operation. Uh, this leads to the creation of a dynamic network close to reality where it is possible to make changes to the topology, uh, adding or removing sensors under the network and in the runtime uh, has the ability to self-recognize -reco and adapt to the changes made. Um, the heuristic also controls the operations that sensors do, such as sense operation, transmission, reception, sleep, uh, always making these sensors operate in a more controlled and optimized way. Also, an aggregation algorithm has been developed, uh, which, which allows to distinguish events as high priority activities, and therefore we can do things like send information about events always before the network's periodic information, just for example. And relating to topology, our holistic considers a topology with 120 sensor nodes and uh, just one sync node. Uh, the sensor nodes are energetically and computationally uh, limited in contrast to the sync node. Uh, and in this case, the furthest node is a 10 hopes distant for, uh, from, from the sink. About harvesting, uh, in this work, we consider two types. The first is dynamic harvesting and second is constant harvesting. The first one, dynamic harvesting, was calculated according to the average annual value of solar radiation in Portugal uh, in 2016, uh, considering its variability. So the constant harvesting uh, co co corresponds to the average of dynamic and is used because it is important in all scenarios uh, to have a base simulation need control over all variables. And the, in terms of simulation platform, uh, to carry out the simulations, we needed a platform that respect for essential points, uh, allowed to simulate what will be the behavior of sensors in the real scenarios, uh, easy configuration of network parameters, opportunity to expand the model with introduction of new functions in the future, and last, an easy analysis and validation of results. So for this, we chose uh, Quantiki for the operating systems, Koja for simulations, and MATLAB for result analysis. Quantiki operating system was chosen thanks to its portability, since it was developed for architectures of small, small microcontrollers, and also because it supports event-oriented systems, uh, that is, uh, the kernel supports asynchronous or synchronous events. Uh, in addition, as it is a simple operating system, it provides options for energy savings, uh, whenever the sensors are inactive. So Contiki also offers a communication stack designed for low energy radio communication. And the Koja on the other hand is a software based on Java exp explicitly designed for sensory communications uh, that allows implementation to be done in C or C++. And one of its great advantages is, uh, is that uh, the fact that it allows the development of low level applications such as drives, communication protocols, or even the development of operating systems. So finally, Koja is, is an emulator. So it includes hardware models in its, in its simulations, uh, which make all developed code implementable. Regarding the simulations, we did several tests. Uh, we did simulations with and without uh, aggregation. And please note uh, that um, here aggregation mean that means that each packet has one header and one or more payloads. So the use of uh, aggregation makes the use of headers more profitable. We did simulations with dynamic harvesting and constant harvesting. Uh, the time between the sense operation was a maximum of five minutes in our simulations, uh, but the maximum time allowed between transmissions varied. So we could analyze the behavior of the network with different loads of information. So we use the maximum time of five minutes in some simulations and 10 minutes in the others. But in all cases, we analyze 60 time slots, which uh, corresponds to two harvesting cycles. 
In terms of metrics, we intended to study some points, uh, such as battery level over time in each sensor, the percentage of failure transmission, the capture and delivery of events at the sync node, the time that sensors were in each operational state and the use of data aggregation. And uh, I have here a video of a simulation uh, is scooted in Koja uh, so that you can see the simulation environment that you use. And as you can see, uh, Koja has a lot of tools that um, we can uh, use to help us in the analysis of sensors behavior. Here in this video, we only show them some of them, but there are many others, of course. So as you can see, uh, the great advantages of Koja is that it allows us um, to analyze the behavior of a network in a more visual and uh, immediate, immediate way. And Koja is an emulator, so it saves us the cost of um, buying physical sensors to do some tests, uh, since we manage to do them in a simulated way. This is the topology. Okay, now let's talk about the results. Uh, the this is the most important part. And uh, in this presentation, I only mentioned um, the most significant ones. And starting with the most important result, uh, the energy neutral operation. Uh, here it is uh, represented the battery level of four different types of simulations that we did. Uh, always when the transmission timer was five minutes. And uh, remember that our goal was to achieve an energy neutral operation at the end of each harvesting cycle. So you can see that this co co corresponds to time slot 60 and time slot 120. So in the first line of this graph are represented simulations in which you use a regression. And in the second line, simulations where this feature wasn't used. Now, if you look at the columns, you can see that first uh, uh, present simulations with constant harvesting and second uh, dynamic harvesting. So as you can see, the main requirement of this work, energy neutral operation was achieved in all cases. Uh, however, we still need to notice some particularities. If you look at the line that uh, corresponds to the nodes closest to the sink, the red line, and if we compare this line with the one closest to the sink, the orange one, uh, we can conclude that uh, the nodes closest to the sink have a battery decrease much higher than the others. And this happened because as we approach the sink, uh, these nodes are uh, responsible for transmitting not only their own information, but the information created by all sensors in a greater distance. That is, they need to process a much larger amount of data, making their battery decrease faster than the other nodes. So this decrease is seen mainly at the beginning of each harvesting cycle, when the sensor has about 50% of battery. Uh, however, when we look at the beginning of the second harvesting cycle, time slot 60, uh, we see that this decrease in the battery is different from what happened at the beginning of simulation. And this happened because uh, when we approach the critical battery zone at 10%, uh, we are unable to perform certain operations to save battery. And this uh, uh, results in an increase in the payloads present on the queue of these sensors uh, during the time they are recovering energy. So at the end of the, consider, uh, at the, end of the second harvesting cycle, uh, these sensors have about, uh, I'm sorry, I, I said second har harvesting cycle, but I mean first harvesting cycle. Uh, these sensors have about 70% uh, more payloads in the, in the queue, which is very differently from what happened at the beginning when the, the queue was empty. But once more time, uh, the main goal was achieved, which is energy neutral operation. And in terms of network utility, uh, this graph shows the sum of packets received by the sync uh, node over time. Uh, it should be noted that in graphs of simulation with uh, aggregation, there is a line for the number of packets received in sync and the other for the number of payloads. Uh, since here each packet can have more than one payload. Uh, and of course, in simulations without uh, uh, duration, there is only one line for the numbers of packets received because each packet must have only one payload. 
And when comparing the use of uh, regression, we see a clear increase in the number of payloads uh, de delivered to the sync node in simulations that take advantage of the use of the regression mechanism. And in this, um, this graph proves to the idea that sensors during their critical battery zone uh, do not carry out uh, tra trans transmissions, which increase the package that they have in their queue. So this causes an increase in the number of transmissions at the beginning of the second cycle. And when looking at time slot 60, we can see that there is a clear increase between the difference in the number of received packets and the number of payloads received by the sync. So once more, this confirms the idea that at the, at the beginning of each harvesting cycle, there is an increase in transmissions on the regression, which results from the packets that were accumulating during the critical battery zones. And when analyzing the data regression, we see that um, the information increases as we approach the sink, uh, since the aggregation tends to increase as well. But uh, the most uh, the most distance nodes, for example, the nodes at 10 hops distance, uh, do not receive information from any, uh, any others, since they are as far away as possible, uh, which means that they only send information created by them. So they use less uh, aggregation and are forced to send packets uh, because the network uh, re requires that the shipments happen periodically in order to avoid substantial increase in latency. So we could, uh, we could easily think that uh, by increasing the time between transmissions, we would be increasing the uh, regression given that the sensors transmit less frequently, but continue to produce the same data rate as before. Uh, however, this is not exactly true because increasing the transmission timer does not mean any, a clear increase in regression uh, since the sensor nodes have physical uh, resources that limit their operations, uh, like high memory to store packets. Okay, as in both cases, uh, the nodes closest to the sink operate in the critical situations. Um, this increase in timer uh, between transmissions does, does not to translate into an increase in a uh, regression. And therefore, we can still conclude uh, that the two harvesting patterns uh, reflect the same behavior. So we can say that the regression behavior is distributed over time and the transmissions are al always optimized, which means that the long-term harvesting variation has no significant impact. And in conclusions, uh, we have created a network that manages its own resources in an optimized way and it's better to operate perpetually, always ensuring that the sensors do not stop working due to the issues related to the battery level, uh, and of course, achieving energy neutral operation. So we can state that one of the challenges we face nowadays has been overcome, that is battery management in wireless sensor network. But in this type of network, there are still some points that we think are important to others in the future like creating an online platform for updated harvesting values, implementing a layer to predict uh, the natural wear of physical, of batteries, physical capacity, studying random topologies and optimal values for the timers, and studying the wireless port transmission to achieve an energy balance between the sensors. And that's all for this presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it, guys. And uh, thanks for listening and for the invitation to share my work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Marco, for your uh, detailed uh, presentation. And uh, uh, yeah, we have the option to uh, ask the questions and uh, I will start myself. Yes. Personality for the uh, US uh, simulator because uh, like mesh looks like an, uh, an uh, promising option for the connectivity topology uh, in, uh, in IoT networks in future. Uh, sorry, I can't understand you well, but you, you asked me about the topology, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm asking about you about the mesh topology when uh, there is a opportunity to communicate uh, not through the star topology, like through the uh, through the uh, uh, endpoint to access point topology, while like a, a endpoint can the data can travel through the several uh, relays and then get to the uh, access point. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand you well, but uh, we use grid topology as it 
it is a topology that allows us to control very easily the connection that may occur between the sensors, uh, which is extremely, extremely useful to validate our model. Uh, and uh, the idea was to validate the model with a well-defined uh, topology and with all connections oh, okay. controlled. Mm -hmm. So in second phase, we can analyze new topologies like mesh topologies or random topologies. But mm -hmm. this is right. a, pre a, pre a, pre a preliminary study, so I we see, need to, to control the connections between sensors. Yeah, 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 I see. That's, that's clear. Okay, right. O okay, guys, uh, anybody want to... Uh... Uh, ask the uh, question to Marco. Uh, may I ask, Eugeny? Sure, Anton, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Marco, it's, it's, thank you for really great research and very interesting uh, simulation systems. Thank you. Uh, we uh, here in uh, High School of Economics, we have similar uh research activities so uh, uh could you clarify maybe i have missed it in your presentation so what's the lifetime for sensors so uh if you use uh one way of aggregation or another uh how the lifetime of sensor is changing so for, is, is there any difference and for what percent so they uh, can work for, uh, so if I understand correctly, all the sensors are autonomous. So they have uh, accumulators for energy supply. Am I right? Uh, yes, they have harvesting modules to, to capture the energy like uh, solar, solar energy. And the, the idea is create uh, an operation or energy neutral operation so to achieve this um, in each time slot, uh, one main algorithm uh, checks if the conditions for sensing transmission and reception are, uh, are set, set, satisfied, uh, always guarantee the end operation. So we create some uh, mathematical expressions uh, that uh, will be run as, uh, in the moments that in the moments that sensor nodes uh, needs to operate. So if these operations are on the vital battery zone or co-compromised energy neutral operation, uh, the operation will not be, be carried out. So we implement some uh, restrictions uh, that are uh, implemented in each sensor individually that consider uh, battery, uh, some points like battery values, consumptions of energy operations and the values of harvesting. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, they use solar supply, solar energy resources. So uh, uh, li lifetime uh, is not so important that it is not considered in this research. So only on network characteristics. Uh, yes, I think yes. I can't understand you well. I don't, I don't know. Uh, so the idea of question is that in some sensor networks, uh, mm -hmm. Nodes are absolutely autonomous, so they have no external power supply, uh, no power, external power supply okay, at all. Yes, yes. Okay, they work yeah. from the accumulator. In this case, uh, uh, usually a lifetime of the nodes is estimated because uh, for some for some uh, aggregation or return or uh, wireless communication schemes, they. Uh, uh, provide, um, they waste much more energy, much more power resources. Uh, and then uh, nodes uh, die because there are no energy supply at all. Uh, so the uh, accumulator is empty. Uh, but uh, as far as I understand, you uh, use solar supply. So this case is not important for you. Yes, yes, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I think that Marco, considering that the energy harvesting works always yeah, exactly. Portugal is a very sunny country compared to <laughs> Russia. <laughs> yes. And, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, so that's like the power source is not a problem. So probably that's the uh, there are some like capacitor that that uh, uses uh, the uh, energy that was harvested from the solar energy, and that's enough to operate sufficient yes, that's uh, right. amount of time. Yeah. So we need more sun 
in in Moscow, Anton. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else want to ask a, a question to Marco? If not, so then Marco, once once again, thank you so much for your time and for your interesting thank presentation. You. Thank really you. appreciate. And uh, then we need to move further. And we the the next speaker is uh, Roman Kovalchuko from Tampere University in Finland. And Roman will be uh, talking about infinitely scalable decentralized routing for wireless mesh networks. Roman, are you here with us? I hope you are. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Great. Can you see me? Can yeah, you... we, we do. We do see you. And uh, we see the blackboard behind you. So probably you will be giving a lecture with the blackboard. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, no. Uh, I hope it doesn't bother you. Uh, it's okay. It looks scientific. Okay, nice. Very well. Um, so you can start sharing your your presentation. Yeah, I'm trying. Okay. Shows me the presenter. Okay. Uh, okay. Now it's. Yeah. See. It's coming. Yeah. Okay. Uh, go here. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. First. Uh, before I start, I'd uh, like to ask you to uh, change the view so you will have uh, a screen with uh, everybody's heads or uh, previews on the left and put it there so it will not interfere with my presentation. And I will do the same. Okay, uh, my name is Roman Kovalchukov. Uh, I'm from Tampere University and from Faculty of Information Technology Communication Science. And today I'm going to tell you about uh, our uh, solution for infinitely scalable decentralized routing uh, for wireless mesh networks. Um, today uh, I will start with uh, first answering the question why we ever need mesh networks. Uh, show you a couple of typical use, usage cases. Um, uh, we, then we'll talk about some problems of conventional mesh routing protocols. I will uh, tell you about what is geographical routing first, and then what is a virtual coordinate system and virtual coordinate systems uh, routing. Um, then we'll talk about how address resolution works in our solution, um, so about some stat characteristics of our um, solution, um, how uh, address establishing algorithm works, and then uh, I'll demonstrate to you a couple of uh, uh, cases, how it works in real uh, time. And then I will be answering questions and uh, conclude the session, uh, the, my presentation. So why we need uh, mesh networks? Uh, and to illustrate uh, better the answer for this question, I will show you a small um, a meme. Uh, okay, if, imagine you have uh, like somebody next to you and you want to send a picture to him. Uh, or he's like in the next office or uh, around somewhere. And he asks you, can you send me a picture? He says, okay. And it goes, so hell no, where around the world, some servers in the United States or maybe somewhere else and comes back to your friend. And he says, thanks. Okay, but imagine if uh, we are almost 8 billion people on the earth and around 50 billion devices already are there uh, connected to the internet. And if everybody wants to send something and we such, um, such a uh, bad idea to send it over uh, and over again, uh, what we want to send, not only pictures, but video, uh, stream video or um, something like that. The amount of overhead is uh, huge and uh, according to predictions the number of devices and the, uh, the whole
whole market of the uh, devices connected to the internet, such as Internet of Things, Internet of Objects, um, and also wearable uh, object, wearable um, devices, and in machine type communication devices, uh, the market is growing uh, and it's not going to stop. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about some uh, scenarios where this particularly uh, will be a suitable solution, uh, mesh networks. Uh, first, I want to introduce an example of Burning Man Festival. It happens uh, in the somewhere in desert of Nevada, as I know, and there is no internet connectivity uh, pretty much at all. Uh, a lot of people who wants to communicate to each other with high density of users, and there is no infrastructure available, as I said, and uh, this scenario is uh, described by quite a relatively low mobility. Another scenario that I want to talk about today is uh, ski resorts or mountains or trekkings where we have low density of users. Uh, there also infrastructure is quite limited or is not available at all. And, but uh, the mobility of users quite high on the contrary to the previous example. So what are the problems of the conventional uh, mesh routing protocols? Uh, here's an example how we would simulate such a uh, network. Basically, it uh, would work uh, with a huge amount of uh, communication overhead to establish routes and basically operates while flooding the whole network. Uh, if you want to find somebody you want to send a message to. And our task is to decrease the amount of this routing information. And the solution would be the creating of a virtual uh, coordinate system. And first, uh, to uh, explain you what's a virtual coordinate system, uh, I need you to understand what is a geographical routing. So uh, imagine you have a, a XY coordinates and the nodes uh, placed on the, uh, somewhere in the space. And if you know a coordinate of your destination and your own coordinate and coordinate of your neighbors, you can just send data towards the destination and eventually it will reach it anyway. Uh, another, uh, so the idea of virtual coordinate system, uh, when we do not know, uh, uh, the real positions of the net, uh, of the users use uh, some sort of um, network addresses that are mimicking a uh, coordinate system, uh, physical coordinate system, so-called virtual coordinate system. And we can use uh, these uh, network addresses to aim towards our destinations. Uh, so here is the small example how approximately it could look. So if we have first a node joining the network, node zero, uh, zero. Uh, um, first node to join the network will choose the address zero, zero. The next one, for example, choose address five, five. Uh, another one uh, will choose address five minus five. Okay, we're not talking about how exactly they are choosing these addresses, but it's something that we want to achieve, yeah? Um, the first, uh, next question that we, I want to talk about, okay, what if we have this uh, virtual coordinate system? For example, like this on the right, yeah, we have uh, some sort of uh, coordinates, which are, doesn't mean the, the, the real physical positions, but some relative positions. And what if we want to find somebody and we don't know where he is, like, and what is his address in this virtual coordinate system? For example, Alice, um, uh, in that case, uh, we need to uh, first store uh, our um, position in this virtual coordinate system in some specific place where everybody can find it. And for example, Alice then first will obtain her own uh, virtual coordinate system address. Um, 
how will, will she do it, we'll talk about later. But imagine she ha somehow knows that her address is this. Uh, later, he will use a specific hash function that will hash her own name, Alice, into a virtual coordinate system address. And for that case, uh, she uses hash on her name, Alice, and he gets this address. So it's placed, for example, right here. And she will send then a store message towards this uh, virtual coordinate system address. It will eventually reach there and also will be stored everywhere who was hearing this message. Uh, and uh, But the main place where it will be stored is the closest to this address. There might be nobody with exactly this address, but it will be stored with some uh, on the node that is the closest to this address. Okay, now uh, let's imagine that we want to talk uh, to Alice. For example, Bob wants to find where is Alice. Uh, he hashes her name, Alice, into a PCS address. Because the hash function is the same, he will receive the same address as uh, in the storage case. So he will uh, send a query towards that address. And somebody who knows uh, where Alice is, uh, he knows her recent position, uh, he will respond with uh, her real address here. So now Bob is capable of sending any data towards Alice. Okay, um, the critical characteristics we want from our solution are, uh, it, we want it to rec reflect somehow the physical topology up to reputation, maybe to scale. Uh, we want it to quickly converge uh, for various network densities and scenarios with mobility and non-mobility. We wanted to handle uh, nodes joining, of course, and leaving the network, uh, handle the mobility of the nodes, uh, merging and disjoining uh, several networks, and also handle non-complex uh, uh, topologies with dead ends. Uh, what is a dead end? So if we have uh, um, an address, we want to send a message to, from A to G in this example, and using uh, greedy routing, so uh, sending uh, data uh, towards uh, always to the closest, closest to the destination, uh, we will stuck somewhere, so this is a dead end, and we want somehow our solution to uh, fix this problem and find uh, the destination anyway. Uh, so uh, how would we deduct our VCS address? Uh, so we do it based on local available knowledge, such as two hop adjacency. So for example, if this is our node, uh, we have one hop adjacencies, uh, nodes who are directly connected to us so via beacons or some sort of messages. We know uh, two hop adjacencies, the nodes that are connected to these nodes, but we do not know any information further. But also we know uh, we could estimate the distances uh, to the neighboring nodes. Uh, so uh, using only this local knowledge, we want to establish our uh, position in virtual coordinate system. Uh, and the idea is to slowly, uh, uh, first node will choose his address at random, and uh, the next node will slowly uh, push, uh, and uh, we want to establish push and pull forces uh, from the neighbors, uh, direct neighbors will uh, pull towards us, and uh, to help neighbors, because we are not connected to them, they will push from us, uh, and we want to uh, find a net force of this all push and full pull forces. And um, 
uh, eventually it will establish some sort of uh, address uh, that will be quite stable. Uh, so for each uh, one hot neighbor, uh, we will uh, have a vector um, um, with a uh, uh, with a uh, that uh, expose force on us um, with uh, such a function uh, there uh, where uh, the i would be the estimate of the distance uh, to this uh, neighbor. Yeah. Then if it's closer um, in a virtual coordinate system, then it will push away towards uh, its proper uh, distance uh, or our estimate of this distance. And if it's, uh, so it will experience negative force or uh, pull force. Or if it's uh, in virtual coordinate system further from us, then it should be, uh, we'll have a positive uh, pull force. Uh, for each uh, two hop neighbor, there will be a bit different function. Um, uh, so the force will, uh, would be either uh, zero, uh, where um, and this uh, node in virtual coordinate system is uh, placed uh, further than the limiting distance that uh, are, is approximated by maximum reception range of this particular uh, radio interface. Um, and it would be a, a negative, so pull force um, if it's uh, closer in virtual coordinate system. Uh, so uh, let's let me uh, show you uh, some uh, couple of examples of uh, these uh, how it would work. Uh, this is a static case with 30 nodes uh, at the same time joining the network. So on the left you will see the physical positions. On the right you will see this virtual coordinate address positions, and on the uh, by the color. Uh, you'll see the uh, third um, um, dimension that is added to st uh, stabilize the position of the node. So it has some somewhere to uh, uh, move around um, and basically shows the stability of the chosen address. Uh, so now we see how nodes are quickly uh, finding their position in virtual coordinate system. And they're still jiggling a bit because the pull and force, pull, pull and uh, push forces are still uh, experienced by these, uh, by uh, nodes from other nodes, you know, from their neighbors and uh, their two hop neighbor. And as you can see, uh, this, uh, virtual coordinate system positions are quite uh, similar to what we have on the physical so real positions and if we uh, rotate it and flip it so we have quite a uh, good um, representation uh, of their real physical positions uh, this is not ideal but it shouldn't be actually uh, to uh, for providing a good uh, quasi geographical uh, routing. So the next uh, demonstration would be a dynamic case. On the left, you will see again the physical positions of the nodes uh, joining one by one the network. On the right, you again will see the virtual coordinate systems uh, system addresses. Uh, so now nodes are joining the network and VCS addresses are uh, establishing uh, quite quickly and they are uh, stabilizing uh, quite quickly. Let's look at it again and you will notice how uh, the no uh, networks are joining when we have a connection between uh, several parts of the mesh network when we establish one part and another part. For example, at this point, yeah, and you see how they are joining and uh, 
joining one single uh, network. Um, yeah, and after all of them are connected, all 100 nodes are connected, uh, nodes start uh, turning on and off, as you can see, and they go away from uh, virtual coordinate uh, other system and uh, it changes a bit the topology and after that they come back and find proper position for themselves quite quickly. Uh, so now I want to conclude my presentation uh, saying that, um, so what we achieved is we proposed a new approach for routing in wireless mesh networks. Uh, so the proposed uh, uh, virtual coordinate, uh, coordinate system uh, solution does not require global uh, network information or positions. Uh, our proposed uh, solution does not require um, does not rely on updates, uh, it does rely only on updates uh, from the uh, neighboring nodes and uh, neighbors of neighbors, so hold two hop uh, neighbors. Um, uh, from disability point of view, the solution has been found quite quickly recover from network changes. Uh, it's also handling uh, nodes joining and leaving the network and uh, I didn't show in this presentation but it also uh, works quite well for the mobility cases. Um, so uh, uh, the proposed solution uh, is envisioned to be applied in distributed wireless mesh networks and not only as standalone routing solution but, so, but also as a complementary uh, to standard on-demand routing, such as AODV, etc. Uh, and our solution may show uh, significant uh, performance gains uh, since the amount of routing information distributed in uh, our VCS solution revolves linearly opposed to the conventional routing uh, for mesh networks uh, where um, Amount of uh, gain, uh, amount of overhead grows uh, exponentially with the growth on, of the network size. Uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. I'm glad to ask uh, to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much, Roman. I would really post a question to you, but I'm a co-supervisor of this work, and uh, yeah. So uh, looking forward, if anybody have any questions that Roman can clarify. So then if nobody has any, any question to, to Roman, I would still ask you Roman about this, uh, the, uh, uh, how heavy this algorithm is and what you do to combat with the with the uh, uh, you know uh, computational uh, difficulties of that algorithm to be uh, deployed on the uh, possibly uh, energy and computational resources uh, limited devices yeah, actually, we have, uh, as you know, another like a uh, algorithm that is uh, more, uh, I would say, simpler, uh, and it works in one, uh, not as uh, one that I showed that uh, gradually uh, works uh, uh, and uh, constantly assessing its position, uh, but one that. Uh, uh, at at a, um, a single moment, just uh, takes what's his uh, address and uh, establishes it uh, uh, very fast, but not so uh, reliable uh, as the solution that I show today. And uh, uh, if we can uh, assess uh, quite 
calculate uh, efficiently the distance to the, to the neighbors, uh, the solution uh, is not actually so far to, um, it's not so difficult for the devices to, from the computational point of view, because uh, there's very simple uh, you know, calculations done. Yeah, so it's not, not intense, right? So it's- Yes, uh, it's not net intense, just the summation okay. of some vector. Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, quite, uh, quite uh, uh, low. Uh, yeah, light in, in computation. Yeah, light, light in computation. Uh, so it should work on, uh, we, we haven't actually tried it yet uh, on the actual uh, equipment, uh, but I think that shouldn't be a big problem for the devices uh, to run this. Uh, algorithms yeah thank you for the question yeah okay Heard thank you to ask something no okay okay no sorry okay yeah seems like uh, nobody uh, no one wants to to get the the the, the presentation is so clear <laughs> yeah i hope so it's so clear yeah. that nobody okay has yeah effect. Thank you very much uh, for Thank the you so much, Roman. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and, and efforts. And then uh, we're gonna have the uh, next speaker that is uh, uh, Anton. Uh, Anton, uh, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Very good. Yes. So Anton, we're gonna, gonna present, uh, yeah. Yes, share my presentation. Just yeah, by the way, I see a very sunny Moscow behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, summertime. Okay. So we should do now. So uh, actually, partially my presentation will uh, consider this sunny weather. Uh, so just a second. Shade. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's can here. you see it? Yes. Uh, great. So my presentation is about human detection on thermal images and comparison of several approaches, uh, including both uh, computer vision methods and methods based on uh, neural networks. So uh, the goal of this project, actually, it's a real in, uh, project with one of our industrial partners. Uh, is to uh, develop efficient algorithms and system uh, for detection of people, I mean vertical human figures, uh, in thermal images from thermal infrared uh, camera. Uh, so uh, the result of the works could be used uh, in pedestrian detection or traffic management systems. Actually, uh, the problem uh, for uh, uh, which uh, have to be solved within this project uh, is uh, to develop a system which can be installed on a large truck, uh, heavy vehicle, uh, uh, which are usually used in the remote areas of Siberia and in, uh, Middle Asia uh, in industrial facilities, for example, a toilet production or any uh, other types of industrial facilities like container yards or steel making plants. So most of them are located in remote uh, eastern and northern areas with, uh, as uh, we just described, with the long, very long, dark winters and really bad rain and snowy weather uh, and uh, uh, very bad weather conditions. So actually this leads to reduced visibility for drivers, uh, which uh, results uh, in killing and injuring people uh, on a uh, road uh, because they cannot detect, they cannot uh, 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 detect them uh, by their own visual, visual channel uh, in time. So the idea is to signal the driver, so like attention people on the road and prevent a serious traffic incident uh, because, of course, we'd like to save uh, people's life and uh, uh, save problems for industrial plants because all the 
uh, incidents of such kind, they occur in, uh, of course, uh, calling the police, uh, stop of normal production of the facility, and that's cost some money, so that's the idea. So uh, what uh, are the key uh, requirements? So uh, first of all, uh, of all real-time conditions or close to real time, because latency is really important uh, in this uh, case. Uh, target of uh, frame per second rate is uh, from uh, eight frames uh, per second. Why it's so low? Because low end uh, thermal cameras usually use frame rate nine or maximum 10. So in this case, uh, we should orient to this uh to this uh, rps of thermal cameras uh, so uh of course the system should show high efficiency with a low probability of false uh, positives and false negatives uh, we orient to low end uh cheap cameras so cheap i mean uh about one to maybe two thousand dollars so uh thermal camera or uh, one two thousand uh, dollars can show resolutions about resolution about 320 by 240 with as i said before about fps about nine or ten uh, but we hope that in the future uh, advanced cameras which right now cost for example 10 to 20 thousand dollars with the resolutions 440 by uh, 640 by 480, uh, the price uh, uh, could be cheaper, and uh, we should consider this uh, scenario too. So uh, actually, we're into two, these two resolutions. Uh, of course, we should consider typical picture problems of thermal cameras like uh, noise, object color, blur, and etc. Uh, we should understand that the resultant uh, solution could be should be installed on moving vehicles, so the background is changing. So many uh, methods of detection background, statical background, could not be applied here efficiently. And we're into night conditions only, uh, because actually the problem of detecting people uh, in real time when we have a lot of light and good weather, uh, actually, it's solved by normal cameras uh, for detection people on RGB images. So here is the architecture of the final solution from the stage of uh, receiving the image video frame. Then we use many algorithms, many different solutions. So today I will explain and I will describe some of them briefly and uh, show some results. So. We provide Troy filtering where we uh, are looking for thermal region of interest. So, uh, region of interest uh, for thermal cameras in this area is called Troy. Uh, then uh, we use applied post processing, uh, picture extraction, uh, and uh, use different classification algor algorithms for human detections. Uh, in this research, uh, right now we use two uh, base data sets. Uh, one is from our industri industrial partner from a uh, low end thermal camera. Uh, it's a real uh, video sequence uh, captured on uh, uh, real industrial facility, real industrial object factory. Uh, during the night with quite bad weather during the winter uh, and another is a classical typical uh, data set for this work uh, FLIR from uh, the producer from the vendor of thermal cameras uh, the image sequence is obtained is captured in california both during the night and uh, uh, during the day so there are two kinds of uh, pictures uh, uh, one picture from day uh, during the daylight, another one during the night. Uh, uh, the resolution is higher, as you can see. And the problem is that uh, all uh, pictures 
uh, uh, again during the uh, during the summer, so during the hot hot weather. In hot weather. So what algorithms we are going to analyze and compare? Uh, so two algorithms uh, are based on computer vision approaches, uh, computer vision methods. Uh, one is based on TCMO algorithm uh, and uh, another uh, on uh, triple histogram based methods. Uh, and uh, we uh, used two neural networks. One is SSD, and another is RCNN uh, and faster RCNN, which works uh, together uh, with PicaNet uh, network. Uh, so here are the uh, uh, links, references to uh, corresponding original papers. So uh, criteria which is used for understanding is our detection correct or not is intersection over union. So we divide the overlapping area to the area of the uh, united uh, uh, images. So it's a typical criteria for uh, this uh, uh, for this task. So uh, I should uh, spend one minute for and uh, explaining the typical detection pipeline. So first of all, we provide hypothesis generation and then hypothesis verification. Uh, most of the publications in this area uh, use a simpler scenario. So they use two inputs. One is from RGB camera uh, so uh, visible images and another input is thermal image, which are used for generation of the uh, hypothesis where uh, whether the people are located on the image and then they verify this uh, idea. Uh, the problem is that uh, during the night condition or during the bad weather conditions, so the uh, normal camera, RGB camera doesn't work at all. Uh, so we do not consider this scenario. We use only original uh, thermal image. So uh, I have to describe briefly methods uh, which uh, we use for analysis uh, of the uh, thermal images and detection of people. First of them is a method based on triple histogram. Uh, so the key uh, uh, the key idea of the methods uh, is as follows. So we detect all the contours, all the edges uh, on the uh, thermal image, then uh, estimate the histogram of the uh vertical uh so so uh estimate the histogram uh, bar graph you can see it on the bottom of the slide uh, which shows us the regions where the borders where the edges contours uh, are located and concentrated in the uh, uh, in the most intensive way so then uh, as you may see on the right of the slide, uh, the uh, thermal regions of interest, vertical ones, are estimated. Uh, then uh, we detect, so we detect only contours, only edges in these areas, uh, while triple histogram based, uh, because uh, we uh, there are several types of histograms. One is based on the information about contours and edges, uh, and another one uh, is based on intensity and so on. And when uh, uh, all the histograms, all the troys are combined into one, so
So we have the limited number of counters which are uh, interested and can be taken into account uh, to uh, detect the people. So uh, as you can see uh, uh, on the right bottom of the slide, so the uh, so a people consist of several counters. So and the last uh, stage, the last step is to uh, unite correctly all the counters to get uh, only one. So another group of methods is based on PCMO algorithms, uh, which uh, cut the image, which, which uh, finds the optimal point of cutting the image on two parts. So uh, you may see this cut and the selections uh, on one of the pictures. Um, uh, so uh, the first stage is similar to the previous algorithms, is uh, to select vertical region of interests, uh, then get binary mark, and then uh, get a binary mask. So from the input thermal image, we obtain a binarized image. Uh, so just two layers. Uh, with bright object and uh, all others which are not so interesting for us. Uh, then on the binary image, we try to find counters, uh, filter them, and then as on previous uh, approach, we uh, try to unite them to get uh, a limited number of counters uh for uh, uh so we try to get only one but usually there may be two or three for each uh, person for each uh, human figure uh, actually the small based method is very interesting so there are many uh, papers in this area but as i said unfortunately they focus on the scenario when we have two import sources uh, one from rgb uh, camera and another one for, from thermal one. So uh, that's really a problem and uh, it took for our research group some time to adopt this method for only one uh, thermal uh, uh, input uh, source. Uh, what I'd like to add here is uh, that actually uh, the small based method is quite, oh, it, it's very interesting, I think it's quite efficient but it was described about 15 years ago. And uh, in that time, so it, it, uh, really 15 years is quite a, a big time, a long time for this uh, area for uh, machine learning. And there are no reference implementation and actually uh, the description is not so, uh, so ha has no important details, unfortunately. So actually, uh, in this work, the similar based methods, uh, uh, so many parts of in of uh, this method uh, were developed and um, uh, and uh, implemented uh, 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 from the scratch, so from the very beginning, because actually there were no so detailed uh, explanation of this method as I show on this slide. So typical problems of uh, both methods, I mean, uh, the triple histogram based and based on PCMO algorithm uh, is uh, that uh, when we binarize the image, uh, we cut people, figures uh, into several uh, not connected parts. And uh, the problem is to unite them uh, so to together parts of the people uh, and uh, understand that this all these parts belong to one person. Uh, another more popular approach uh, is uh, based on neural networks. Here is the architecture of uh, Kikanet network. So uh, we decided uh, to use uh, 
uh, approach and win methods where econet is used to understanding the uh, to, for, for detecting the regions of interests uh, then we uh, create uh, one special uh, layer with uh, lighted objects which uh, uh, are received from Piconet network and then uh, send it forward uh, this layer uh, and original thermal image to RCNN network. And uh, as you see, it really works. So the objects are detected. So here you may see some results. Uh, this uh, slide shows uh, uh, results of triple histogram based methods. So actually this method really work, works very well uh, on images uh, from the first data set uh, from uh, industrial video, but for FLIR it works not so good. Uh, so uh, SSD, uh, really works uh, very well. SSD uh, neural networks works uh, well on uh, both video sequences, but the problem of this network is uh, that it um, the false negative rate is really very high. So right now we are solving this problem for SSD. Uh, TCMA-based uh, works, uh, actually it shows approximately the same results as SSD, uh, but here is another problem. So the false negative rate is smaller, but it uh, uh, unites. Uh, so so for when, when people uh, are located very close to each other, so it unites all the figures to uh, one uh, region of interest. So uh, maybe in the future, we used this TCMO-based method as the first stage uh, for, uh, example, for the uh, sec uh, success ones, for the uh, successive uh, neural network, which will detect uh, human figures within the uh, selected uh, bounds, selected region of interest. Actually, RCNN shows the best results. So right now, I'd like to show you just a second. Uh, so here are our metric values. So as you may see, uh, the best result is provided by RCNN, uh, so with uh, uh, two uh, neural networks, uh, Piconet and RCNN. So on uh, two uh, video sequences, on two data sets, uh, it shows error rate uh, about four or five uh, percent. And for industrial videos, for FLIR, it shows uh, uh, even uh, smaller error rate, so about uh, two percent, the probability of uh, errors of second type, so uh, uh, false positive. Uh, so uh, other methods are not so efficient. Uh, actually, the uh, best result shows a combination of. Uh, TCMO and RCSD network. So uh, as I said, when we first of all uh, detect uh, borders using TCMO algorithm like on this slide, and then use RCSD, uh, fast implementation of RCSD to detect uh, uh, separate figures within the region of interest. So that's the uh, uh, best approach. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you can see, faster RCNN with uh, Piconet is the best one, but there is a big problem. It's the slowest one. So, right now we're thinking about optimization of uh, this method uh, based on neural networks. So, I think that's all for today. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Anton. Anybody has any questions to Anton? Feel free to uh, to unmute your mic. And meanwhile, I, I would like to ask you, Anton, about yes. the, uh, you said that you got a data from, uh, and it's kind of a project of the industrial collaborator. And, and you yes. got a data, the, like, uh, the data in Russia and data from California. So I'm just curious how uh, how different those data are and can you really apply the trained algorithms uh, like uh, worldwide or they are kind of uh, weather specific? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, all uh, this, try to, so, uh, Unfortunately, many of these uh, of the approaches are weather specific. So the key problem, one of key problems of our research, is to use uh, is to find weather independent approach. And mm -hmm. it seems yeah. that we are very very close. Uh, actually, okay. th th this data set from FLIR. So you may see that uh, it's very hot in California, and yeah. very often. Uh, the temperature of the road is higher than the temperature of right. people. That's yeah. the biggest problem. And uh, for uh, Northern, uh, so for video sets which uh, are captured in the North, there is another yeah. problem. The uh, people are much uh, warmer, much hotter than the surrounding areas, see, surrounding uh, air. Uh, so uh you see there are some uh yeah, like big, big special yeah. yes yes special noise uh, yes because it's also uh hotter than uh the air and uh, surrounding area far uh, see, on the larger distance yes i see okay thank you thank you anton and um, uh anybody anyone wants to post question to anton at this stage So if not, so then uh, we just uh, thank Anton and move ahead. So we have uh, uh, one more speaker now. I see on the timetable from uh, uh, from Miem from High School of Economics, uh, Rostislav is going to talk about the coding modulation schemes. And uh, Rostislav, are you ready to start? Yeah, I'm here. Just very good. Yeah, just uh, oh. share your screen. Yeah. Uh, is yeah, it's okay? coming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Here, you mm -hmm. can start. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Shinyad uh, Shinyad and my topic is the search of coding modulation scheme considering statistical properties of data source. So uh, today, uh, today we talk uh, uh, about uh, uh, introduction. Uh, here it is uh, my, uh, my structure of my presentation. So uh, let, let's uh, start. Uh, today we can see an exponential growth of uh, data transfer. So uh, you can see. Uh, uh, data compression is now so long important as it was uh, a long time uh, ago, but otherwise computation efficiency, energy consumption, uh, and complexity decreasing, uh, especially for low energy devices uh, uh, like uh, uh, Internet of Things, our feed, and so on, uh, still is hot topic. So uh, the uh, the uh, main goal for my uh, 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 work he, uh, was uh, is uh, uh, was to develop and analyze uh, schemes of transmission uh, information transmission considering statistical properties, uh, provide theoretical formulas, and uh, using uh, a, a, a bit error rate and capacity uh, metrics for measure the results. So. Uh, uh, this uh, topic uh, are hot on, on the uh, on the world. So, for example, uh, Nokia Bell 
like provide some information about uh, uh, constellation shaping and uh, they proved that it, it is possible to increase the total scroll put up to uh, 25% using uh, the uh, shaping approach. Uh, and of course, uh, the Huawei uh, also work uh, in this topic. So uh, let me remind the typical communication uh, schemes which uh, 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 provides the source block code, which generates some symbols, are and some probabilities, and uh, some coding and relation uh, block, and uh, channel with edit white Gaussian noise. So let me remind about the quadrature plus modulation. Uh, a modulation is the process which represents some bit stream into career wave. So, and uh, some signal can be uh, represent as complex value and the average uh, complex value R, and we can measure the average energy of signal using the formal one. Let's see, quite simple. So, uh, there is a weather. We have a, a serious uh, problems with the sound. Uh, it looks like a wind uh, in your room or something. No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, probably, is it, is it okay? Well, when you start to speak louder, it becomes like heavier. Okay. Is it only for me or everybody also having that same problem as I do? Me too, me too. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think it was me. Ah, okay, so probably somebody else just uh, need to mute the mic. Sorry, Rostislav, you can go ahead. It was seems like it was a, uh, the noise from, from somebody else. Okay, so let me introduce the main idea of about the shaping cam. So if we uh, have uh, symbols uh, from source with non-uniform distribution, so we can map uh, the most frequent symbols into constellation points with the smallest energy. And the average energy uh, will be decreased. So we can uh, compensate uh, the loss of energy by increasing uh, the distance between points. And here it is an example uh, with uniform distribution on the right and non-uniform distribution on the left, mapping by efficient way. So uh, let's uh, uh, add uh, some ad additional approach. So if we uh, want to uh, minima uh, minimize uh, the average transmitted energy for a given bit rate, so the best possible distribution is the maxwell boltzmann distribution for any dimensions of uh, constellation. Uh, so let, uh, in this work, we use uh, the maxwell boltzmann distribution uh, with the probability of symbol R using this formula, uh, form, formula two. So uh, let's continue. So let, uh, let's compare the, uh, 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 let's uh, estimate the capacity of uh, SCAM and communion uh, uh, come with uniform distribution. Uh, and here it is uh, the results. Uh, the green line is the channel limit, and uh, solid line uh, it is the convenient cam with the uniform distribution, and uh, other li other lines is the uh, cap capacity with the scam. Uh, and you can see the scam line uh, lines uh, are more closely to the channel limit. Uh, and uh, the gain uh, roughly one dB. So uh, as I uh, so I uh, I said before, uh, we uh, the when we have non-uniform distribution, uh, we uh, loses an energy, and you can uh, we can compensate the energy 
uh, by uh, some coefficient a. Uh, it's uh, uh, I I will call it's a is power distance. Uh, and uh, here in form of four, we can see the difference between energy with uniform distribution and energy with non-uniform distribution for a special camp. And in this work, I uh, will measure the bitrate uh, as uh, entropy uh, by uh, using form of five. It's classical form. So let's continue. Uh, uh, as, as I said before, uh, if we have non-uniform distribution, it not only loses the energy, but loses uh, the entropy or average bitrate. So uh, we, uh, and if we have uh, some source which generate some symbols, uh, for example, uh, 64 with entropy four, uh, we uh, can use two approaches. We can uh, compress uh, uh, our um, our symbols, uh, some uh, good entropy uh, encoder, and uh, modulate using uh, CAM16. Uh, but we can, uh, we, but otherwise, uh, we can uh, do not use compressor, and uh, use CAM64. Uh, using the shaping and uh, measure the average bitrate. So here it is uh, the results uh, of two systems. Come uh, 16 with uniform distribution, uh, theory and practica, and uh, SCAM approach with, with, constellation, uh, with 64 constellation points, uh, uh, theory and practica here. And you can see uh, the uh, second uh, communication, communication uh, scheme uh, provide again roughly one uh, one point uh, five uh, dB. So let's continue. Uh, but uh, uh, in the previous uh, system, we uh, used a different uh, come come. Uh, uh, constellation points. So uh, let's uh, fix uh, the number of constellation points and also we want to fix the number of information transmitted bits and average energy. So uh, let's introduce uh, the error correction block code uh, rep represented in my work by Reed Solomon codes. And uh, we want to fix the total bitrate, uh, this, uh, this entropy, and this is uh, KN, uh, it is uh, the characteristic of Reed Solomon codes. So for, for, uh, for come with uniform distribution, of course, a non uniform distribution. And here it is uh, the results Theori theoretical and practical. Uh, with uh, total betrayed uh, uh, equals one, uh, two, uh, sorry, 2.133. And so on, uh, and we can see that uh, their uh, system uh, scan with non-uniform distribution and um, uh, the, yes, scan with non-uniform distribution and uh, <clears throat> have again uh, roughly four dB. So, but question was, uh, I'm sorry. Can we improve uh, our results? So let's introduce uh, our optimization problem. Uh, we want to minimize the theoretical uh, bit error rate. We want to uh, understand what the maximum achievable gain uh, for, for bit rate for this system. And here it is uh, the results. Uh, with uh, uniform distribution and non-uniform, and uh, the to uh, total ultimate gain roughly six dB in comparison with uh, classic con conventional uh, communication scheme. So uh, let's uh, introduce uh, the last approach uh, was which was uh, done. So 
uh, LDPC uh, had a uh, decoding algorithm based on soft decision. And the main idea was uh, what if uh, the uh, decode, decode, decode after come block have uh, know about their uh, uh, source distribution, uh, distribution of source. So, and he just uh, the results. Uh, I, I had uh, a three system, which uh, first system is the uh, system with uniform distribution uh, with the uh, LDPC betrayed uh, uh, this uh, LDPC betrayed and uh, the second one uh, so, uh, so in red uh, line is the scam uh, uh, non-uniform distribution with uh, using the scam but the decoder after come do not uh, doesn't know about the input distribution of source. And the th third one is the SCAM uh, system with the, uh, with the, uh, the knowledge about the so source. And you can see uh, that, uh, uh, and you can see we have, uh, if uh, uh, came the modulator, uh, Considering uh, considering uh, the input distribution uh, can provide the gain if uh, if uh, if uh, they not so let uh, let uh, let summarize so constellation shaping allows uh, the increase increased bit uh, betray. Uh, with the same uh, reliability in comparison with uniform distribution. Uh, theoretical results uh, uh, consider this uh, practical. And the maximum achievable gain for capacity is roughly uh, 2.5 dB. Uh, maximum achievable gain for uh, bit error rate is roughly 6 dB. And the considering non-uniform distribution uh, in decoding uh, may reduce the total bitrate on the system. So that's all. Thank you so much, Rostislav, for your uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, I, I, I got a one question that if you just uh, roll back with the slides, I forgot the slide number, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, it's oh no, no, <laughs> too fast, really. With the with the results, one more, one more. This one, yeah. So I wanted to uh, um, discuss this uh, the results that you write that average gain is up to four dB, right? However, your graph suggests that. It's it just an average, so you have different, uh, uh, radically different results for the uh, different uh, error rates. And uh, yeah, could, could you comment? So this is like average is somewhat to me sounds a little bit uh, not the correct uh, uh, word to to compare the results. Yeah, uh, I compared uh, the uh, on the top on the top line. Uh, uh, uh -huh. with, yeah, okay. this is roughly four dB. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, I see. But then you have a larger difference, right? Yeah, we have a gap between theory, theory, and practice. It's mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the Reed Solomon codes uh, provide some uh, influence in the source. Okay. And that's okay. why I my theoretical formulas do not uh, consider this. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Yeah. And that's okay. why we have. Yeah, now it's clear. Now it's clear. Thank you so much. And um, uh, yeah, I had just one question. How about uh, the rest of the uh, attendees? Are there any questions to Rostislav?
If not, so then we can uh, thank Rostislav uh, once again for his uh, presentation. And I think that was the last, uh, last presentation on uh, our seminar on selected topics in the comms. And uh, I'm really thankful for everybody who uh, gave a presentation and uh, attended uh, this, uh, this seminar. And um, I have to say that in future we're going to organize uh, uh, more implementations and uh, we'll try to uh, make it a little bit more focused on the topics because some of the topics were, uh, well, pretty far from each other today. However, this is just a first ball rolling. So then, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed. Hope you did as well. And uh, if nobody wants to say anything at this stage, If not, so uh, then from, from my side, from uh, oh, yes, participants Anton, from please. Higher School of Economics, I would like to say uh, really a great, very big thank you for a very interesting uh, presentations uh, from our international colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anton. Thank you for the kind words. And uh, okay, guys, so let's stay in touch by email and stay safe. Hope pandemic will uh, disappear sometime. <laughs> Thank you so much and take care. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you all. Bye. Bye.